All right, happy Thursday, guys, and welcome to today's video. This video is going to be more than just the agenda for today, so it's really important that you're listening. And as you'll notice, my face is up in the top right corner, so you can't miss it. Okay, so here's the game plan. Number one, make sure you watch this video. You're already doing that. That's amazing. You should give yourself a pat on the back. Number two, in a few minutes here, I'm going to send you on to Schoology for sort of a Dora the Explorer moment. And what I mean by that is I'm going to ask you to pause the video, go do something for me, and then come back to the video. And it's going to be about a map, which is my favorite. I love maps. Um, after that, I'm going to give an overview of something called the French and Indian War, a very important historical event that changed the world. It's another one of those fun little ingredients that helps that pot boil. And then finally, after my video, you're going to transition to a new video. It's kind of a video heavy day here where you will be watching an Ed puzzle all about the French and Indian War with a few more details and some interesting facts about who was a part of this war. Okay, there should be no homework today, so just make sure that you're using your time wisely. With that, on Schoology, there's going to be a discussion post, and it is this map here. This map and this line right here is the actual line that divided out the original 13 colonies. Okay, we've been learning about this era. We labeled a map before um, with this era and with this um, territory that was governed by the British, right? But specifically, this map is talking about demographics, meaning where the people who are there are from. So you'll notice that each color reflects where the settlers that are there, as well as the slave population that's there, um, is from. So for example, this orange color represents Scottish, green represents English. So what I'd like you to do is answer the three questions at the bottom of the screen in the discussion post on Schoology. So you're going to pause and go and answer those three questions. Pause and go and answer those three questions. Okay, so welcome back. Here's that same map. If you did this correctly, once you posted, you should have been able to see the answers at the top of the page where I posted for you. So you can go and check and see if you got the correct answers. But for a variety of reasons, I wanted everybody here to understand a little bit of who was actually a part of these 13 original colonies. You'll notice the majority of people are really squished towards the center and then it gets more spread out. Um, that's because those were really those first colonies. Remember, Virginia was really the first permanent colony after Jorms Jamestown really sort of survived, right? Um, but it's also important to note that there are different types of Europeans here, as well as we know, um, different African populations throughout, especially the southern territories where the majority of the farmland was in the cash crops were. Um, Nonetheless, I think it's important to understand that it really was this collision of different groups of people that hadn't really been uh, collided before in history. So um, when we're talking about the 13 colonies, we're talking about a hodgepodge of people. That's important to remember here. Yes, majority English, but many other groups of people as well. Okay. Now, let's sort of pick up and put ourselves into the context of history here for this next part. Assuming I can get the slides to work, Mrs. Lopez. Okay, so let's review. Last week, I had you guys watch a video about Jamestown, and in that video, you learned about the struggles of this colony. Yes, there was even like suggestions of cannibalism and eating somebody's pregnant wife in order to have enough food to survive. Yes, we did not come from that glorious of beginnings as maybe you once thought. Um, with that being said, even though the colonists were starving and struggling to find sustainable sources of food and water, they just kept coming. Yes, this map gets bigger and bigger and bigger because people are just hearing about this enticing new place. And again, remember, Europe was kind of the worst. Yes? And so it grew so much that by 1750, just before the revolution started, we were up to a million people. 
when I say me, we, I mean the United States at the time or the colonies, my descendants were not here by then. Um, so I apologize, I'll try not to use the word we. Um, and you know the original 13 colonies, you've heard these words before, you've heard these states before, obviously their boundaries are gonna change a few more times before they're actually set in stone. Um, but a million people nonetheless, and they start to form booming cities like New York City and Boston. And it's important to understand that this population growth meant that effectively there was a whole new society of people exploding in the colonies. And I think in some ways it might be more than what the king had bargained for. So the king decided back in England across the way that he was going to give those colonists some independence. He decided to sort of run the risk of them being too independent, which I think we know maybe doesn't work in his favor, but he decides to let them have some sort of self-government. Why? Why did they have their own government? Because he wanted them to deal with, quote, everyday problems while he was across the ocean. Think about it this way. When I lived in downtown Chicago, I lived on a street called McLean Avenue in Wicker Park. We were right in the neighborhood, really good food, it's an awesome neighborhood. And as you know, I'm also a pretty active citizen. Um, and when I lived there, there was a giant, and I mean giant, pothole outside of our apartment. And often I would see cars go by and either get close to a flat tire or they would just downright get flat tire. Um, and it really became dangerous. Um, it was sort of like an unofficial speed bump that was not a good thing to encounter. And so I would petition uh, the government to fill in the pothole. But think about it. Would I write a letter to the president of the United States to fill in that pothole? Probably not. Instead, I wrote to my alderman and my alderman actually got that pothole filled in. So let's talk about how impressive Mrs. Lopez citizenry is. I mean, pretty cool I got that pothole filled in on the clean avenue. You should go check it out. It's a pretty impressive pothole. It's no longer a pothole, it's just like a pile of tar. Anyway, with that being said, that pothole problem was not something that the federal government, the president, should deal with. That's a small problem, even though I thought it was like the biggest deal in the world. Small change compared to what else is going on in our world today. Yes? So the king thought, how about you deal with those small pothole problems, colonies, and I'll deal with the big stuff. And maybe this will give you some sort of power and control over yourselves, but not too much. Yes? Um, and people wanted to, throughout the colonies, try out some of those enlightenment ideas, and they started to practice what's called representative government, or republicanism, which is something we learned about. They wanted to sort of create branches, for example, in Virginia, just like Montesquieu did. Um, they wanted to create, um, like Rousseau had, sort of a modern democracy with people participating in voting. And so they started to establish these governments that were actually kind of against the king's ideas. Um, now, why is this happening? Because of those really infectious, in a good way, infectious ideas from the Enlightenment. For example, Virginia decided that each community should have two representatives and all the representatives would meet together. Flash forward to today, that's effectively how our Senate works. Each state gets two representatives and they all meet together. And right now they are sitting and sitting through the trial, not the trial, excuse me, the um, congressional hearings for the approval of um, a new Supreme Court justice. Now, the second example here, Plymouth colonists signed a compact agreeing for a form of sort of majority rule government where all men would vote on issues. So again, majority rule would be if I were to cast the question out to our class today, raise your hand if you want cookies for lunch. Um, or stand up if you want macaroni and cheese for lunch, and the majority would decide what we are having for lunch today. So each colony had its own form of government, which in some ways might be risky from the king, but again, it was because he didn't want to handle those small everyday problems. Meanwhile, the king enjoyed, and trust me, he enjoyed them, the economic benefits of the colonies. Just look at that outfit and that wig. My gosh, I looked that, I wish I looked that cool. And on the other hand, there was the formation of a sort of a semi-enlightenment kind of idea, parliament. We're gonna hear that word quite a bit. It's a system of representatives in Great Britain that shared authority with the king, but it's important to understand that parliament passed the laws, 
but the king in England at the time had power to shut those laws down. Um, however, there were ways that it limited the king's authority. It was sort of a checks and balances kind of situation like Montesquieu wanted. Um, and they did sort of start to work together in one way or another. So this is sort of what's happening across the Atlantic Ocean. However, take a guess, which group of people did not have representatives in parliament? The colonists. Okay. So why is all of this so important? Even though the king and parliament still had authority over the colonies, representative little sort of small pot bubbling kind of governments became the norm. And there was a ton of resentment growing. The colonies felt like they could do this on their own. Especially later on when Great Britain asked the colonists to fight a war for them that they didn't even want to do. And that leads us to this conversation of the French and Indian War. This is from 1756 to 1763. The French and Indian War took place between the French and largely the British. Now, the French, with the help of various Native American groups, was able to actually fight pretty efficiently against the British. And look at their bright red coats. But the British were also able to fight back uh, with the help of Native Americans. And why were they fighting in the first place? Over land, over territory. If you remember, the French were a part of colonization too. Um, and their territory was just west of that line on the map earlier today. So this was a fight for territory with the help of Native Americans. It is a poorly named war, but it is between the French and the British, which trust me, if they called it the French and British War, they would have to find out a new name because there were so many French and British wars throughout history um, that we would have a problem there. And that I would argue is, is one of the main rivalries in history. Now, the war itself, again, was over territory, over land, and the British actually won, barely, but they did win. And you're going to find out more about this in the video. But the reason we are learning about this is because this really opened the door for a country to start forming, even bigger than the British American colonies, the 13 original colonies we had talked about before. So this first map over here is the British American colonies in pink. British also had some control way up here in, north, in the north. I'm not sure exactly why they want all that territory, but they did. Um, and then the orange was the French. And by the way, the French would get Canada back um, eventually. Um, now, the disputed territory is this territory right here, the Ohio River Valley, all the way up until the Mississippi River. So if you notice this border right here looks like Illinois, that's because it is Illinois. Um, the Mississippi River is our western border of our state. Um, and so it wasn't quite Illinois, but getting there, all right? Um, and so the disputed territory here was sort of this range right here. Now the war, which was, I think, British sort of uh, fatal mistake, possibly, um, led to even more expansion. So here you'll notice Illinois all of a sudden is now being sort of engulfed by the British uh, colonization efforts. So the war had a big geographic impact. It led to a huge geographic shift. But more than that, it really, really led to the start of our revolution. So that's the end of my discussion here about the French and Indian War. You're going to learn a lot more. Um, here's the agenda from the beginning. Um, remember, you should have already done that discussion post on Schoology in my Dora the Explorer moment. You should have paused the video and gone and done the discussion. And then um, you should have heard a little bit about the events leading up to the French and Indian War. And now you should jump into the Ed Puzzle video. Now, a few small tech things about the French, er, about the French and Indian War Ed Puzzle. Number one. Um, watch it in Safari. Once you get that link there, try to watch it with Safari and try to log into your Google account. If it does not work, please email me. I have confirmation from a bunch of tech people that it should work today, and I'm really hoping it does because I love that puzzle. It works great when we're at home. Um, so please take the time to really try and see if it works. Um, and if it does not work, let me know ASAP. Okay. With that, you are free to go, scholars, and I hope that you learn a whole fun, a lot of stuff about the French and Indian War. Have a great rest of your day. Goodbye.